You can't contradict that these are the best numbers of our lives. Yeah, I- you can't. I mean, we had guns and butter when we were doing these things 50 years ago, and that followed with inflation and recession. I don't see inflation. I don't see recession. 50 years ago, that number was a curse. Now it's a blessing. And you know something, Joe? It doesn't, I can't, it doesn't matter whether you hate them or like them. These are real numbers. And that was Jim Cramer with CNBC on the jobs report that came out on Friday, December 6th. And Jeff, that's part of what we're going to be discussing, not only the economy, but the impact that could also have in the presidential election. Just part of what we'll have on the agenda for today's review of the issues impacting both Illinois and the nation. Jeff Berkowitz, Illinois Channel, Public Affairs here in Chicago. As you point out, Terry, that was a tremendously important news report. People were not expecting it. Big infusion in terms of jobs created in November. What does that mean for the economy? What does it mean for impeachment? What does it mean for Illinois? Lots of significance there. Finally, Jim Cramer hit on something that he was right about. Well, I think, uh, and anyway, before we get to that, let's go back to some of the big issues of just last week and some, some new developments. We had the Eddie Johnson firing, as everyone knows, and now Charlie Beck is going to be the new superintendent of police for the city of Chicago. Was there something new that happened this past week, Jeff, in the wake of that firing? Yeah, a lot came out. All we knew when we last spoke with the viewers is that the mayor was very angry because she perceived the uh, ex, now ex-superintendent, Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson, as lying to her. She was really, really upset. And, uh, and right after that, more came out, video came out. Apparently, the Inspector General report for Chicago is not done, but that, that, that process allows, if something significant happens before the report's done, he can communicate with the mayor, and he apparently did. She apparently saw or at least heard from him about what the video showed, and she had been told, the public had been told, look, this was a medication issue that Johnson had. Got kind of screwed up on the medications, and so it threw him off. He was explaining why he was found asleep at 34th and Aberdeen in Chicago, like at 12.30 a.m., and they were rapping on his window. His car was running. He was asleep. And he, and he gave that explanation, the sort of medication to the public. And apparently, he told the mayor, well, I had a few drinks at dinner. And what she found out, apparently, from the inspector general after our show, and, and it was disclosed, or at least it was disclosed after our show, is that she found out that there was video that shows him to be dancing. Right? Dri- yeah, well, it was dancing and drinking and uh, kissing for like three hours, apparently, at this Cirrus bar, which is known in the Chicago Loop for its stiff drinks. Well, so, yeah, let, it was reported in the media that he was an that, that, that was last show. week's show. Well, one of the it's things that right. I think is, but this, is significant okay. that came out of this okay. is uh, it wasn't almost that significant that Eddie Johnson is out of the job. The man had already announced he was retiring, and so he was fired with about three weeks left to go on the job. So in that way, not really a big deal. But the mayor did say something that we ought to be looking forward to, and she's saying that this is going to mean a change in the culture of the uh, police department. Here's her comments or a portion thereof. As for the department, yesterday, today, and tomorrow has to be about culture change. That must start at the top. That hard but important work is impossible without strong leadership focused on integrity, honesty, legitimacy, and accountability. So we'll have to okay. see if that if that evolves, but certainly that would be a, a, a good goal to have for the department. Well, and point of to note <clears throat> quickly about the culture change that she's talking about is that now the media are reporting that this this investigation that's going on was going on to Eddie Johnson by the Inspector General could reach much broader to a cover up by police covering helping Eddie Johnson cover up just how drunk he was. Again, he described to the mayor he had a few drinks after dinner. He didn't say, I spent three hours dancing and drinking in a bar for, you know, three hours, and then I got in the car, and then I drove, you know, from that restaurant uh, to drop off the person who who was on his security detail, a policewoman. So now we're involved. Is there sexual harassment? Because this dancing and kissing was not just with a woman other than his wife, 
that happened to be with an employee of the city of Chicago, Chicago police, okay, who was working with him. So that was one that let, came let out. Let me add something. I won't spend too much time on this because okay. we got other things to go to. But did the police, if anyone else had been pulled over, the police probably would have asked them to take a sobriety test. Was Eddie Johnson given, do we know, a sobriety test on the scene? You no, know, short conversation. They said to him after they woke him up, apparently, we don't know all that, but it sounds like what the media are reporting is that they woke him up by rapping on his window. They said, are you okay to drive? He said, yes, and they let him go. Well, and that, yeah, that was the other thing. I was, yeah, was going to say the other thing is they had him drive home alone. They didn't drive him home, right? They right. didn't say, hey, so you, 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 you were sitting there at a stop sign unconscious, falling asleep, maybe okay. even if the man was just too tired to drive. I mean, uh, he didn't have so, to. You know. In short, there are four significant things here, okay? One, he was drinking and he was driving, and that's a tremendously dangerous thing. And he was doing that, apparently, from the loop to drop off this policewoman at headquarters, which is a few miles away going south, uh, 3510 South Michigan. Then he was driving uh, from there by himself to where he was found at 34th and Aberdeen near his home. Then they let him drive. After they found him, the police let him drive without a sobriety test to his home. That's a very, very dangerous situation. So, um, so you know, that, so, that's so significant. So we'll have to see what comes of this. And the, the fact of the matter is uh, his actual firing by itself wasn't a big deal. But... Yeah. What happened, as we're saying here, might be, and that's something certainly we got to look at, and if it results in a new culture and a new push for a culture, then that would have lasting value. But, Jeff, there's other things we need to get to. I do, but I just want to mention, because it is important, I said several points. The other point is, are other police involved in that cover-up? Because that relates to what the mayor is talking about as to a culture change. The last item is it's reported that the policewoman herself removed the SIM card from her cell phone and that's a part of the investigation. Was she involved in some obstruction of justice type thing, tampering with the evidence? So there's lots, lots on the plate there yet to be resolved. Now we can move on. All right, and we wanted to talk about, uh, I guess, the economy. The economy continues to boom nationally and here in Illinois, but everyone knows that Illinois is still digging itself out of a hole. Uh, the big problem for everyone has been the pensions and the diversion uh, but the governor, Governor Pritzker, who's now been in office uh, just about 11 months, uh, says that Illinois is turning the corner and that he's got five things that he tells his staff they're going to have to focus on. Everybody on my staff can cite these five things because they hear about them every day, every week uh, that we're in office uh, from me. And that's, you know, pensions, property taxes, uh, balancing the budget, paying down our bill backlog and growing jobs in the state. Now, there are other things we could all cite that we need to do for sure, but just on the fiscal front and financial and economic front, those are five things that I have to, you know, that I have to spend every day, every week focused on, and we need to, you know, work at solving those. So five things to focus, focus on, Jeff, and one of the things that uh, the governor wants to do is go before the voters in November of 2020. It'll be election year, and he wants to change the Constitution and allow for a progressive income tax. Uh, that's been done in other states where they raise the uh, tax on the uh, on the higher income earners. Uh, but one of those who says that's not going to be a good thing is Dan Proft, who recently uh, spoke at the City Club when he debated the issue. Let's listen to what Dan Proft, the conservative radio host, had to say. Uh, the, uh, a, a case study, a case study on the millionaire tax, contrary to what Ralph said, Maryland. Uh, the Wall Street Journal wrote about it, uh, and they, re they rescinded their millionaire surcharge after they did it. But, but, uh, but I agree with you. Here's the point we, ha we have agreement, so I just want to emphasize this. It is not solely the state's income tax rate, or even were the rates to be graduated. I haven't said that. I said in context of every other decision that's been made, every other metric that influences cost of doing business, that is competitive in the 50 laboratories of democracy, Illinois is on the wrong end of those metrics. That's the fundamental problem. So this just exacerbates this proposal would just exacerbate the death spiral we're already in for all kinds of other and additional reasons. 
well, this discussion should be going on publicly. It's not. There should be a Republican leader who is responding to Governor Pritzker. They do not have one, but this is the discussion. The, the, may, the governor is saying five points. One of the big ones he says is pensions. You didn't hear any pension discussion there. You went to the progressive income tax. You might say, well, where is that in his five points? Well, I guess that's in balancing the budget. Because if you look at the remainder of the discussion at the Chicago Economics Club by the governor, he talks about you know the, the, the other one of the other five points being the budget. He says the budget's currently 40 billion. He's a little low there. And he says, you know, it's, it's never been balanced for 20 years. He doesn't say it, but it's really not balanced. His is it? It must not be because he says we're about two billion dollars short. You know, in other words, even though he and others are talking about that as balance, there are holes in that budget. Okay, and he's and we won't go on about that. But he's a two billion dollars short. And he said, "What has he done?" Well, he's asked. He has asked each agency and state government uh, about what the budget would look like and what their spending would look like if they cut it by six point five percent. That's not an across the board forty billion dollar cut, but it might be a billion dollars there. But the, the short point, that's not the solution to this to the state's problems. That's like a trickle. That's a small thing. That's what that's what Prof said. Look, you're talking about the progressive income tax, and the, he's debating whether with Ralph Martiri, Prof does, whether progressive income tax is a good thing, whether it's pro-growth, so forth. But he and he says, look, Maryland was such a disaster they had to rescind it after Martiri gave an example of a state he thought where it was working. But he said, more to the point, Ralph, more to the point. Every metric you have in Illinois, we're going in the wrong direction. So you can't just talk about the progressive income tax. It's important. Prof argues it would be detrimental to growth. But you've got to talk about these other things. And again, and what other the, things is the, that? Well, the governor raises five points and he says one of them is property tax. And he says, look, I, I did something on the consolidation of pensions. You know, the local governments will now have a little bit less to worry about. But the governor later on points out, it's generally a small part of your local property tax. Education is the big thing. And he says, well, how am I going to solve that? He says, okay, well, we're going to lower the burden of the, because right now, he says, Illinois is spending, is providing too little of the state funding. He says, Illinois should be, the state government should provide a larger share, maybe from 25% to 50%. That's a big jump. That's more spending by the state of Illinois. So if you're going to cut, if you're going to give more money from the state to the local government to cut the property tax, where are you going to get that money? Is it all going to come from the, this new property tax? You know, you've been promising, promising so much of that new property tax to different things. So the question, the main point is, and this is what Prof would say if you were here today, in addition, where are the reforms, Governor Pritzker? Well, the governor only been reform, in only one not even one year. The governor will be give, giving a new uh, a new budget coming up in February, uh, and we'll have to see what he said. He actually had, as many people said, a pretty historic first uh, session of the legislature when he came in, passed a number of major things, including, of course, a $45 billion capital budget. Uh, they got the budget passed on time, which uh, was not happening under Governor Rauner. Uh, that was a struggle for four years. So uh, things, uh, at least in the sense of predictability, uh, are improving. You can't expect someone to turn the state around uh, just in the first year any more than anyone else could uh, turn around something where we're coming out of quite a, quite a hole. One thing the state does have going for it, which is a great national economy. And that's been noted when the governor spoke earlier, saying that all regions of the state are getting jobs and that the state of Illinois currently has the lowest unemployment it's had, I think, in its history or certainly in about the last 50 years. And Jeff, imagine as bad as the economy is of Illinois as far as getting its own house in order. If, if we were in bad economic times, if the state was having to pay more in unemployment benefits and Medicaid coverage and other uh, social welfare spending, so, you know, this is the time when we got to make hay, I would say to all those who are listening with this great economy, and many people say it's the greatest in our lifetime, that Illinois needs to be able to make the reforms, make the changes, and get its economic house back in order now before this but, ends. 
but talking reforms, and we'll get to the national economy and Illinois economy and the national election shortly. But before we get there, since you're talking reforms, you know, you had uh, two uh, Illinois, two Republican legislatures in the state of Illinois, Alan Skillicore and uh, Representative Willauer, call for Governor Pritzker to schedule a special General Assembly ethics session. Okay. So they tried, they did something, but it was pretty small in the veto session. And so it's Skillicorn's contention that, you know, you need to have, a, you had to have a special session and you need to focus on ethics because in his view, this state is kind of falling apart. If you look at the Fed investigation, which we can update now, what's happened with the Feds and the U.S. Attorney's Office? Well, Jay Doherty, head of the City Club, resigned and this time his resignation was accepted and this is all over the media as a major matter reported and discussed by ttw on the program chicago week in review reported and discussed on wbez and cranes and cranes who is basically chicago's business journal said there are allegations that jay doherty may have been a conduit for up to a hundred comed finance jobs and then on TTW, well, TTW says, well, this all seems to go back to Mike Madigan. Can we say he's a target? Well, it was either TTW or one of the other media said, you can't say he's a target. The, F the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office are usually rather mum as to who their targets are or subjects, certainly at this stage of the investigation. But what do we know is that the subpoenas that have gone out from the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office and, and, and the raids conducted by the FBI have focused with asking a lot of information about Mike Madigan, about crony lobbyists, about ComEd, and, and on. How do we okay? know that? Well, we, we look at the subpoenas. They generally become available uh, to the public, to the media. And so you know what they're looking for. What they don't know is what's the larger picture here? I've written and speculated, and the speculation is that the uh, U.S. attorney may be looking at filing a RICO complaint, racketeering influence corrupt organization. We mentioned that last time. What do you need for a RICO complaint? Well, you need some kind of criminal enterprise. So okay. who's doing the Let criminal Let me remind the viewers enterprise? that a RICO uh, came out about, what, 30 years ago or so? and was 50 it, years, 50 years. Was it that 50, long ago? Signed by President, signed by President Nixon. Well, and, and it was really a, a tool to be used against uh, the mob, so to speak. The racketeers, right, the mob, right? And it's extended then to white collar. It really has not been applied, as I've contemplated here, speculating, to the political situation. But you have to ask yourself, if they're not, why are they subpoenaing so much information about ComEd and about... Um, uh, and about Mike Madigan and about lobbyists and why did Ann Promisuri, the CEO first of ComEd and then of Exxon U Utilities, resign about a month ago? Well, and so this, those are the questions this might be tied. It's all speculation. This might be tied to a bill that passed the legislature about two years ago. Uh, it was called the ComEd, nicknamed the ComEd bill. It was to bail out some of these uh, nuclear power plants. Without going into details of it, the speculation is. I mean, that was a big money bill in the legislature. Speculation is that might be, this investigation might be tied to to some of that and that what they are investigating is maybe what was going on behind the scenes. Again, that's well, speculation. How do you, so. Right. How do you pass that kind of bill? As everybody knows, a bill never comes up unless Speaker Mike Madigan wants it to come up in the House. And if it doesn't pass in the House, it doesn't pass in the legislature and it doesn't get signed into law. So Mike Madigan's important there, and he's important in terms of getting representatives to vote for that bill, and he's important in terms of getting lobbyists uh, to perhaps help get money to them. So, and ComEd is important as to who Jeff, they let's do this. We don't want to spend the whole show on this point. The point okay. is, it's a developing story. People got to look at it. There's a couple of new developments. We've talked about that. Uh, and we'll just have to pay attention. We'll have to see what happens. When you're doing a federal investigation, no one knows when they're going to uh, pop the cork, so to speak, and say, this is what we've got, this is what we have, we're going to make charges. Uh, we could have a federal investigation that goes on indefinitely. And, you know, maybe we're not going to know anything for 
for months or it could be weeks. We don't know, but we'll we'll pay attention to it. We have well, other to be issues. Fair, let's but let's just mention one other ethical issue we glossed over. Just want to be fair. We've talked about Democrats. Maybe it's time to talk about some Republicans in the ethics issue. So we've talked about Alan Skillicorn talking, asking the governor to call a special session to deal with ethics. As you know, around the same day, which was just last week, I think it was announced by the governor, he added uh, several folks to the joint, what is it called, the Joint Commission on Ethics? Joint, yeah. And the people he was adding, was adding was Lieutenant Governor uh, Stratton, uh, uh, Anne four, Spillane. Four the, people, right? Anne Spillane, close, formerly close with Attorney General Lisa Madigan, David Harris, his revenue director, that is Republican. the current revenue director, Republican, and a former state rep. Stephen Anderson. And a for, another, yes, a, well, two former state reps. This Harris was a Harris, state Harris, rep, and so yeah, was Harris, Harris and Anderson. 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 Now, both of the, yeah. both Harris and Anderson work for the governor currently, as you said. David Harris, a Republican, right. when he was leaving the legislature, which uh, he was going to retire, the governor, the new governor, Pritzker, picked him to head the Revenue Department. Anderson is on the, the Human Rights Commission, I believe it is, so he's also well, taking a job yeah, with the state. So on one hand, just to put this in some context, the governor has two Democrats, two Republicans. The Republicans that were picked are, are closely associated with the governor. On the other hand, if he's going to pick people, he's not going to pick his enemy. So... Uh, should he be picking his that. lieutenant governor? Is that is that too close? Is this supposed to be a legislative commission, or is it supposed to be a joint gubernatorial legislative commission? I think it's on, but I as think I it's on ethics, which in the state of government, uh, not just in the but legislature. But something you know something about, Terry, maybe you can talk a little bit about what's the issue with uh, Senator Plummer and Republican leader Bill Brady. Uh, Senator Brady, it was reported, not by us, but by others, uh, that... Mark Maxwell, right? Mark Maxwell with WCIA, a local uh, Central Illinois television reporter, does a good job. And he had a report that uh, uh, Senator Plummer, who's down from the Metro East area, he's a freshman just, just elected a year ago, uh, that he was uh, approached by Senator Bill Brady, the Republican Senate leader, and Brady apparently or reportedly said to Plummer, I will put you on the commission uh, to uh, in, investigate uh, some of this, I believe, gam uh, was it the Gambling Commission? I forget now that I'm dropping the name. Of the Gaming Commission. The Gaming yeah, Commission. Gaming, yeah. uh, but apparently he asked Plummer not to press ahead with Plummer's bill, which would uh, prohibit uh, people from serving in the legislature if they had an interest in gaming, which Senator Brady does have. I interviewed earlier and this just, week, let me get to this bite, I interviewed earlier this week's uh, Representative Alan Skillicorn as well as Blaine Willauer, and we they were calling for an immediate uh, special session uh, of the legislature, which is not going to happen. The governor instead appointed this commission we just talked about. But uh, we... Uh, Representative Skillcorn told us what he's hearing from his constituents and why he was saying that this is an urgent business that needs to be addressed. Well, I talk to my constituents, which I do every day. What do they want? Well, if they want to root out corruption, they don't think legislators should be lobbyists, and they don't think that legislators should negotiate in back rooms deals that would benefit themselves. And frankly, we've got, you know, especially in the gambling thing, uh, there's so much money to be had, there's corruption there, and right on our noses, it appears that there was backroom dealing, uh, negotiating these deals, and also the caucus position. You know, that is something significant. Now, one person can have a job in certain areas, and maybe they can recuse themselves, but you can't negotiate on behalf of a caucus and also have an economic interest on it. That's not right. So what Skillcorn is saying is you can you can be maybe just an individual senator, but he was saying that you can't be a leader of an entire caucus if you don't have the uh, the standing to speak for the caucus when you yourself have a personal interest. And just to clarify, I think you referred to Brady having an economic interest. I think technically he doesn't have what the law calls an economic interest. He does benefit from getting commissions from placing these video games or poker games, whatever they are in various bars and so forth. He has a relationship with a gaming company that does that. But having said that, I think it's time to go on. We only have a few minutes left and we promised people we would get to sort of maybe the national issue 
with Trump and impeachment and Bloomberg. Can we do that all in three minutes? We can shoot. So, you so yes, five, so we already mentioned at the top of the show they had the jobs report come out on Friday, December right. 6th. Great numbers. They were expecting 187,000. They got 266,000. Unemployment fell again to 3.5%. Jeff, when I was back in high school, they used to think economists that you could never get below 5% unemployment, that that would be full employment. Here we are at 3.5%. And we do not have inflation. The point is, it's a very, very strong economy. We had a very, very strong jobs report. Uh, a lot of journalists are just passing that by. They don't remember when Nixon was almost impeached and had to resign. He had a terrible economy. Stagflation, skyrocketing interest rates, skyrocketing inflation. Those two numbers were associated. Low GDP was called stagflation. What does Donald Trump have? He has a burgeoning economy. He, lowest unemployment rates in a half a century across the board for women, for minorities, for higher middle income groups, everything. And that's an issue for the Democrats who want to proceed with impeachment. Yeah, so it's, it's, great, great, news for, it's great news for the <clears throat> economy. It's great news for workers. Uh, we had average hourly earnings going up 3.1% from a year ago. So we're, we're not having uh, that, that slow growth uh, economy that we had suffered through for the better part of the last 15 years or so. And, uh, but as, as you were saying, that also has uh, political ramifications. And Jeff, uh, Trump is looking strong with the economy. Uh, James Carville under uh, managing for Bill Clinton's campaign back in 1992 famously said, it's the economy, stupid. If it's the economy, Trump is going to be cruising to re-election. And many also are saying you, that, that uh, the Democratic Party, their candidates for president are the weakest that they have ever seen. And that means that uh, they're looking at other candidates. Uh, Hillary Clinton said the other day on a we British a show that she yeah. might even think about jumping back in. Yeah, okay, forget Hillary. You know, forget Warren, forget uh, Sanders, uh, forget Buttigieg, forget Biden. What do we got? We got Bloomberg, Mike Bloomberg, okay? Look, this guy's a job creator, he's a leader, he's held office before, performed well. He's the Democrat savior, so to speak, okay? And he, he could spend some of speculated the ridiculous sum of $12 billion on ad revenue. And he's, he came out of the box, I think you may have a clip to show, of what he's showing off as one of his preliminary bio ads. Do we have to take a look? But when he witnessed the terrible toll of gun violence, he put his money where his heart is, helping to create a movement to take on the NRA and the politicians they own, to protect families across this country and help turn the tide. And he's funded college educations for thousands of deserving low-income and middle-class kids and supported life-saving medical research and stood up to the coal lobby and the outright denial of this administration to protect the only home we have from the growing menace of climate change. But now he sees a different kind of menace coming from Washington. So there's no stopping here. Because there's an America waiting to be rebuilt, where everyone without health insurance is guaranteed to get it, and everyone who likes theirs can go ahead and keep it. Where the wealthy will pay more in taxes, and the struggling middle class will get their fair share. And jobs that just allow you to get by will become jobs that let you get ahead. Mike Bloomberg for president, jobs creator, leader, problem solver. All right, so you heard it here. Look, Trump will be impeached in the next week or two by the uh, U.S. House. It will go to the Senate in January. January will be a trial. He won't be removed. And then it could be Bloomberg be, be Trump. You heard it here. You heard it first. Say goodnight to the folks, Terry. Good night, folks. Thanks for watching.